Good morning, everyone. It's my honor to welcome you to the Youth Perspectives on Climate Change Online Symposium. My name is Felipe Flores, and I'm a PhD student at the GIFS College of Architecture, as well as a co-organizer of this event with my graduate fellow, Naif Anihat, who is a master's student at the College of International Studies. As a member of the Security Contest Think Tank and the Center for Peace and Development at the University of Oklahoma, I would like to take this time to acknowledge these organizations for making this first event of its kind possible. The climate crisis is often perceived as an issue of the future. In contrast, the stories from our panelists and their communities they will share at this symposium today highlight decades of environmental injustices and climatic challenges. The panelists will also address key issues from environmental racism and marine conservation to the crucial role of indigenous communities as front leaders of the environment. The symposium is a Global South and indigenous focused climate awareness event and is aimed to offer an opportunity for panelists to advocate for communities that need critical attention as well as an opportunity for attendees to challenge common misconceptions about the cl current climate crisis. Gabriel, would you like to get us started? Thank you, Naif and Felipe. First of all, I would like to thank you all for this opportunity to be here today. Spaces for exchanges like these are increasingly needed and it is a great pleasure to be able to share the table with other young people who are thinking and actor, acting for a fair and sustainable future. Well, first I would like to introduce myself briefly. My name is Gabriel Alves. I am a political scientist, law student and researcher at Plataforma CIPO. And CIPO, for those of you who don't know, is an independent Brazilian think tank led by women that emerged in the middle of the pandemic. And it's focused on the production of data on climate and environmental justice, as well as governance and peace in Latin America and the Caribbean. As an organization from, from the Global South, you can imagine that the themes are countless, especially when they are themes related to environment and climate. Well, making a brief overview, Brazil is facing a devastating scenario of an increase in environmental crimes, dismantling of monitoring and control bodies, criminalization of social movements and legislative flexibilization. And all of this was aggravated by the pandemic and of course by the climate change. And it has brought even more vulnerability to people who were already in a critical context of human rights violations. Speaking of human rights, this is an aspect that we must always highlight that the right to a balanced environment is a human right. And this fundamental aspect is often forgotten by the Brazilian Congress when voting on bills that aim to invade and contaminate indigenous lands, or even when local governments impose violent public security policies instead of uh, providing adequate sanitation for peripheral regions. I have decided to highlight these images especially because they kind of sum up our current scenario. We have the mud from the rupture of Brumadinho Dam, and we have black children without, without the right to childhood and exposed to unhealthy environments. We have the mass incarceration of black people also exposed to abominable unhealthy environments. We have the struggle for the demarcation of indigenous lands. We have massive deforestation and flooding in the periphery of Rio de Janeiro and other major cities here in Brazil. Uh, it is in this peripheral context that I would like to focus my speech today on the favelas of Rio de Janeiro. We at CIPO, in partnership with LabJaca, which is a research institute uh, located in the favela of Jacarezinho, and it's focused on the produ production of data from the favela for the favela, we have started a partnership together last year to talk about how environmental and climate racism affects the peripheral communities in Rio de Janeiro. And this analysis was only possible because we did an intersectional, we, it was done through an intersectional lens that sees how race, ethnicity, sexuality, and gender are markers of vulnerability in contexts where there is a purposeful absence of the state and an exclusion of spaces of participation and the perpetuation of structures that arise from our colonial past. I wanted to highlight this image of Douglas Belchior. He is a leader here in Brazil of the Black Coalition of Rights. And he's holding this poster that states that climate justice without racial justice is the new colonialism. 
And I think that we must always remember that in order to change a pattern of only palliative reforms and start beauty, building new, meaningful changes. And talking about climate and environmental justice in Brazil is talking about how this past, how this colonial past finds echoes in our present. In this way, our 2021 partnership entitled Amplifying Voices, Combating Environmental and Climate Racism in Urban Spaces sought to interview residents of communities affected by the dynamics of environmental and climate racism, and which are reflected, for example, in the lack of access to drinking water and basic sanitation, as well as by the economic, human and social costs of recurrent floods. We produced a series of audiovisual content on Instagram containing frames from some of the interviews. In one of them, we meet the stories of Maria, Humba and Anna. And I would like to highlight the interview with Anna that really got my attention because she stated that the absence of the state are purposeful and a result of the racism that persists structuring our public policies. And I think that that's a major aspect because we are talking not only about environmental and climate racism, but we are also talking about necropolitics. We are talking about a proposal politics of death that imposes uh, more disadvantages to certain communities, often marked by race, gender, and ethnicity aspects. In another statement, Dona Maria, she did this one in the the older woman in the, in the picture, she has 81 years old. She said that she has been bitten by a mouse because mice always appear when there are floods and floods always happen when it rains. So in this case, we can see that the lack of resilience and adaptation is a constant in the favelas. And another interesting aspect is that she didn't know anything about climate change and racism, even though she suffered directly from it. So I think making our researches and speeches more accessible is also a way of promoting climate justice as well. Well, in addition to interviewing how these populations have been affected by climate and environmental racism, we also sought to learn about initiatives that promoted environmental and climate justice. So we, had, we made this interview with Ezequiel, who is part of an urban agriculture project called Hortas Cariocas which is a reference towards the promotion of sustainable development and well-being of the population. He highlighted that the project brought new green jobs to the community because it took people like him who were unemployed, gave citizenship to them and the ability to live better. In this case, we can see the role of local communities filling the gap of government inactions. Well, our new project also in partnership with LabJaca We'll carry out interviews in the same model, only with a focus on the water crisis in Brazil. We have already released the teaser and at the end of my, my speech, I will try to show it to you and don't worry, it's subtitled. So the central goal of the next project is to promote environmental and climate justice by drawing attention to the need to strengthen water security of residents in urban spaces in Rio de Janeiro. We want to promote access to information, transparency, participation and accessible research on water insecurity in the favelas, including its impacts on human health and well-being. The project also wants to encourage local engagement in denouncing uh, factors behind water insecurity and in demand for solutions by state authorities. And as a reminder for you all, it's a lecturer year in Brazil. That's uh, on the left, it's the picture of a sink in Rio de Janeiro in 2020. The water was contaminated by domestic and industrial sewage. Well, um, these images are some are from some of the most of the major social movements here in Brazil that are currently working with human rights and the protection of several dimensions of the environment. We have MST, we have the, the Movimento Bem Viver, which is translated for well-being movement or Buen Vivir in Espanol. And we have the UNIAF, we have the Black Coalition for Rights. And when I previously spoke with Naif and Flores, I highlighted how the fight for environmental and climate justice is above all a fight for access. It's a struggle to open paths and opportunities. And as a part of a think tank, our struggle is for influencing in public policies that can influence society 
while bringing these discussions to places that they were not used to be discussed, creating public participation and transparency. And it, another thing that I would like to highlight is that the Black and Indigenous populations must be seated at decision-making tables. I also believe that social transformation can only happen from the combination from the combination of research and political action. So our role must be to amplify voices as well as cooperate with existing organizations and movements that are currently fighting for a better world. That's why access changes everything. I spoke with our partners from Labijaca today about this event, and they were really glad that I could join because language is still a barrier that many human rights activists who work on the front line don't have the time and opportunity to learn. So being here today is a chance to echo their voices and my own because climate and environmental change affects us all. So here I'm going to show you the, the teaser of our next project focused on the water crisis in Rio de Janeiro. Let me know if the audio is okay. I'm gonna, oh, it's subtitled as I said before. Desmatamento de mananciais, a poluição ambiental, a privatização de serviços básicos, o sucateamento de órgãos de fiscalização, a flexibilização de leis ambientais e a ausência deliberada de políticas habitacionais e urbanísticas. Essas são apenas algumas das dimensões do racismo ambiental que atingem diretamente os povos pretos, indígenas e das periferias. Povos que lutam pelo próprio território, pela própria dignidade contra as inseguranças de águas contaminadas, escassas, esgotos a céu aberto e doenças derivadas. Onde está o estado dessas pessoas? Quem tem suas ausências? E mais, quem fiscaliza as suas violações? A crise hídrica é um projeto. Isso precisa mudar. A justiça climática e ambiental são urgentes e já estamos atrasados em garanti-las. Os efeitos da emergência climática nos lembram que todos compartilhamos o mesmo planeta. Um ambiente pouco saudável e um ciclo de água intoxicado atinge de forma diferente a todos nós. Well, uh, that was the teaser. You can follow our social media. I have Wait, wait, I have added in the presentation the QR codes for Plataforma Cipó and Lavjaca. Today we are going to post online this version with subtitles, so feel free to share as well. And I think that's it. Thank you very much for the opportunity again. And Ace is up next. Okay, so uh, today I'll be talking about youth perspectives on climate change, uh, the native perspective uh, here in the U.S. states. So I'll introduce myself. Um, my name is uh, Asa Samuels. Uh, I am a member of the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes of Oklahoma and descendant of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. Halito, so Chipoya Asa Samuels, Oklahoma Chata Okla, Anchaluli Misha, Imotoka Sahas Alali. Dos Asa Samuels, Na Asetna, Na Tasia, Na Hanonane, Na Na Atehina. I am also currently uh, holding the title as Mr. Indigenous OU. Uh, I'm the Cultural Affairs Chair for the American Indian Student Association, uh, the student employee at the South Central Climate Adaptation Science Center, and uh, my major is Biology for Wildlife Conservation and a minor in Native American Studies for Cultural Preservation, and I intend to uh, use both of these degrees uh, to impact wildlife conservation with an Indigenous perspective. So um, here's something that, you know, that really, uh, really relates to, I believe, all of us, uh, especially uh, here in the States. Uh, so climate change is a threatening indigenous culture, well-being, and traditional ways uh, for 567 federally recognized tribes uh, here in the states, and that is not including tribes um, that are unrecognized. Uh, there are about 150 more tribes that are uh, that are going unrecognized, and um, uh, we are currently working on projects and and. Uh, uh, policies to see how we can get these tribes who are wanting to be recognized recognized in order to uh, gain funding and to be able to adapt to climate change a lot easier. Um, so I will talk about some of the um, the weathering events here in Oklahoma. Um, a lot of it is unstable uh, weathering events, uh, and I'm just going to read off for the 2011 records. And this is all based on uh, mesonet readings, um, meteorology, uh, even uh, South Central Cask readings as well. Um, so in 2011 through February and August, 
Uh, there was 101 days over 100 degrees. Uh, 50 of those days uh, are consecutive days over 100 degrees. Um, it was the hottest summer with an average uh, of 100.5 degrees. Uh, there's a record, high, a record high in multiple locations. I believe there was like four or five different locations um, in one day, uh, I believe, that had a record of 115 degrees. Um, and this is all sporadic all throughout the state of Oklahoma. Um, the lowest recorded temp was negative uh, 31 degrees. Um, a 24 hour snowfall of 27 inches. Um, the greatest seven day temperature change went from, was the same day as the uh, lowest recorded temperature. And then it went to a uh, 79 degrees within, um, I believe this was February 10th through the 17th. Um, and that's a 110 degree difference. Um, a wind gust of 150.8 miles per hour. And this was back in um, El Reno. Uh, for those of you that are um, you know, familiar with Oklahoma, there was a tornado in Oklahoma that read uh, EF5. Um, and some say that it was probably uh, potentially um, a lot bigger than most of us say it was. Um, and I think during that time, we also had a hailstone that was in a diameter of six inches. Um, so weather is a day-to-day -day type of thing. It's something that we can um, kind of predict, um, you know, through uh, meteorology and, uh, you know, past records of how this thing moves on and through the lands um, where low pressure and high pressure systems are and, and um, you know, how fast they are moving in towards, uh, in, into the land of Oklahoma. Um, and when we're talking about climate change, you know, climate is the average uh, uh, weather over time. So, um, so basically what we're looking at is very drastic changes and we're basically seeing this um, personally, I've seen this personally, um, you know, with my own eyes uh, and my own experiences of, uh, of dealing with climate change and um, how it affects all of us, uh, not just as native people, but all indigenous people and uh, people alike uh, here in the state of Oklahoma. Uh, so uh, national climate issues, uh, the Quillette tribe of, uh, of the Olympic Peninsula in Washington state in 2001, uh, it, it is drifting into the sea. This is a, um, a, a village of 400 indigenous people um, who have thrived here for many years. Uh, this is where they were um, uh, relocated um, back when colonialism and European settlement happened. Um, when we talk about reservations, you know, reservations are used for um, uh, what, I mean, what does a reservation mean? Reservation kind of just means something that is going to be used in the future. Uh, so this tribe was uh, relocated to this location on the Olympic Peninsula in the northwest part of the Washington state. And, um, and they lived here and hunted here and gathered here and they're water people. Um, and not to say that it's dripping into the sea that they're water people, but no, uh, the impacts of climate change and the, the rise in sea, uh, sea level is uh, literally going into their lands and, um, and destroying it. It's they're, they're literally drifting into the sea. Um, and we're talking about, you know, generations um, of, of people, um, of land acknowledgements, of, um, of importance, of sacred ceremonial grounds, uh, burial grounds, um, all these different types of uh, cultural ways uh, to this tribe um, are going to be going away and possibly be gone forever. Um, so this is something that's going on uh, within that uh, area of Washington state. In Wisconsin in 2016, the Bad River Band of the Lake Superior Chippewa tribe, um, flooding was very, very, um, very prominent and um, it was happening a lot. It was not just in this area of the Bad River Band uh, of the Lake Superior, the Chicka Chippewa tribe. Uh, it was happening also upstream. And this is the reason why that Bad River started to flood and it moved all the way down into uh, the lands of the Chippewa tribe. And uh, they experienced uh, 14 inches in eight hours, in just eight hours of rain, uh, rainfall. So um, this is also uh, something that is due to climate change. And it is something that has been uh, sporadically happening. I think the one before this was back in uh, 1960 was the, the, the last um, uh, significant rainfall 
that has happened and they tried to adapt to it and they did adapt to it. They did come up with plans, but the effects of climate change is happening so rapidly and so fast and so uh, extreme that uh, this next event that did happen, they were not ready for. Um, there were some fatalities and there was a lot of, um, um, there were a lot of people hurt during this, uh, during this time period. Uh, the California Hoopa Valley tribe, uh, uh, 2021, um, they are trying to save Chinook salmon from warming waters and non-tribal interactions. Um, with the effects of climate change, you know, we're expecting, you know, global warming, uh, a little bit more of a um, short but very cold uh, winters. Um, so with these uh, short and, you know, very cold winters, you know, um, and a lot of this, these, uh, these melting, uh, I guess you could say ice caps, um, you know, and also due to uh, CO2 emissions um, going into our atmosphere, um, they're experiencing warmer waters uh, there in California, all the way through Oregon, through uh, Washington, all the way up into um, Alaska. Um, so uh, salmon, and there's different kinds of salmon. There's cutthroat salmon, there's dysgenic salmon, there's um, um, just all these different kinds of salmon that range from this area, from this region, all the way from the west side of the land, uh, all the way up uh, up north. You know, they are experiencing these warming waters, and they went from you know fishing from you know a hundred a hundred uh, salmon a day, you know hundreds of salmon a day, to now they'll be lucky enough to to uh, fish maybe ten uh, ten catches a day. So this is a little something that is, um, you know, really, uh, really drastic and really uh, unfortunate and um, that is happening to these tribes because they live basically solely on uh, salmon and the water that is running through there. And it also has to do not with just uh, climate change, but also human interactions with dam building. And um, uh, here, here pretty soon they are uh, looking to destroy three or four uh, dams that are up upstream uh from this valley and um so hopefully that will um you know make some changes um throughout their salmon populations um native people uh here in the u.s are natural advocates and not not just native people but i guess i could say indigenous people altogether uh, are natural advocates you know we're frontliners um we are always on the front lines of of climate change and trying to deal with it by adapting to it um, we've been adapting to climate change ever since climate change has been a thing. Uh, and it's been a thing for thousands and thousands of years. It's just, it just hasn't been so extreme and so um, uh, reliable on, on uh, human interactions. And um, so these experiences that we have gone through from the past to now is what we're trying to bring back. We're trying to bring back that the old knowledges of, of uh, taking care of our lands because we have a relationship with it. The relationship of, with the land just means that we know how to work it. We know exactly what the land needs. We know exactly what to take and what not to take. We know exactly where to go and where not to go. Um, and this uh, deals with contentment. This means that we are content with what we have. We are taught to be um, givers and not takers. We are uh, taught to be, you know, um, uh, you know, happy with what we have, happy with what we what, what we get from the land. And because of this, we have ceremony. Ceremony leads from dance into prayer into um, uh, many tribes. All of us tribes, we're all the same, but we're all different. Um, we have we're all the same culture, but we're different cultures. Um, we all recognize as native people or indigenous people um, here in the U.S., but we also identify ourselves in our uh, native languages and different languages, and we all have different uh, types of ceremonies for um, the regions that we are in. You know, we have uh, different wildlife that um, that that we um, that we celebrate. Um, building relationships between researchers and tribes. Um, these are the actions on climate change um, that we are really trying to uh, trying to take, especially here within Oklahoma, with with uh, with government and and uh, local tribes. 
the relationship here is not very good. It's very unstable. Um, you know, it, it is election year, so this is something that we are uh, looking to change, and hopefully, we have a new governor who is willing to um, uh, establish uh, a good relationship with tribes in order to um, uh, build a good connection with tribes and to use that traditional ecological knowledge that we are uh, desperately needing for all the land and not just um, and, and not just for tribes. Um, we're establishing uh, climate assessments and policies. I'm also part of a state wildlife action plan, which I'm looking at tribal engagement uh, in state wildlife action plans. And it's also going to a, a Recovering America's Wildlife Act of 2021, which was uh, uh, put into um, a policy back in um, uh, March of uh, 2021. Um, it's actually on the um, uh, House of Representatives floor. It's being uh, passed around for votes and um, it's not looking too good right now, um, and this is because you know um, some of these uh, some of our political leaders don't understand about who we are and what it means to be uh, an indigenous person here in the U.S. Um, they don't understand that we are the frontliners that we are, that I was just talking about. Um, adaptation plans, kind of like what I was just talking about a while ago with the state wildlife action plans. Uh, adaptation plans are are part of that, and like I said before, the um, the adaptation plans. Um, a really go off of how we adapted to climate change all throughout these thousands of years. Um, and uh, we've been very, very successful at that. And especially these tribes that are going unrecognized, like I said, the 150 tribes that are unrecognized, they are adapting to climate change. Um, they are affected by it the worst and they are uh, adapting to it the best, if that makes sense. And the reason for this is because they don't get government funding. They don't get any type of funding. So they're basically left to themselves. Um, they do uh, set up plans with other um, with other tribes and try to collaborate in those ways. Um, but all in all, they are by themselves and they are working their own lands and they're coming up with their own plans and in, in, in order to um, be able to adapt to climate change successfully. And then we talked about this uh, indigenous traditional knowledge. Um, now this is knowledge that that need to be used. Uh, to combat climate change. Um, there's a saying it's called, um, or it says, um, you know, we need to use uh, information that is uh, so old, it seems new. You know, to a lot of us here now, you know, we don't understand the values of traditional knowledge and how far back it goes, that whenever we hear something from way back when, you know, it's new to us. It sounds so um, irrelevant. To, to now compared to what it was then because of technological advances and, and to where, how we advance as a society, um, it doesn't seem uh, logical, but at the same time it does because back then we did it, we were doing everything right. Well, if we were doing everything right then, why don't we bring that back and, and, and create change based off those indigenous traditional knowledges? So what is my vision? I shared this uh, picture because this is a youth all throughout here, um, here in the States of different tribe, uh, tribal youth. And, um, you know, those little boy says, I carry the traditions of my ancestors. I'm here. I will be counted. We count. And they definitely do. I think one of the biggest things that we need to do is to get our children more involved in environmental uh, sustainability into conservation efforts, into um, uh, preservation of culture. Um, the reason for this is whenever we talk about uh, wildlife conservation, you know, I could talk about river king, which is a, a keystone species, which really relates to good water quality here um, in the southeast part of Oklahoma. Um, so whenever there is river king, that's when we know that the, the, the soil is good. The water is going to be good because it's a natural filtration system, which is not just good for tribes, because tribes have been using river king for thousands of years as tools and as building and uh, as ceremonial uses but also um, it's a good filtration system for water quality, which um, uh, uh, works for everybody. So my vision is to teach our youth because they are going to be the ones that have to deal with the, the effects that we have put uh, on our planet. Uh, we are, I believe, I uh, at the uh, end, um, within the next 20 to 30 years of no return. Um, so, Let's teach our youth. Let's get them out there. Let's get them off of those devices and let's let's get them more outside more because if we get them outside more, uh, the better shot and the chance that we have of saving our planet and our uh, next generations to come. 
uh, Jakob Gay and Ho Ho. Thank you, Ace. Now you are next. Thank you, Nai and Felipe. Uh, my name is Naf Asim, and I am from the Maldives. I am from the lowest lying nation in the world. And today I want to actually share the journey living in the Maldives as well as what we are experiencing here in the Maldives. So before I share my uh, very short and concise presentation, I would like to introduce myself. Um, I am a marine biologist and an environmental scientist and conservationist here in the Maldives. So I work with a lot of um, different people in my community uh, in terms of advocating as well as um, helping them to adapt to climate change as well as making them, them aware of climate change. So looking into uh, my presentation. So I would like to share uh, my experience here in the Maldives, like the climate change in the Maldives and uh, what uh, we are experiencing. So uh, looking into the Maldives, um, if somebody has not known where Maldives is, uh, Maldives is situated in the Indian Ocean. Um, usually we don't um, see uh, Maldives on the actual world map. But however, we are there. We are the lowest lying nation, as I mentioned before, and we are uh, right adjacent to India and Sri Lanka. We are made up of um, about 1,200 um, individual islets uh, with 26 different atolls. So what atolls is actually, um, from the picture that I'm showing, um, it's different um, kind of circles and round um, whereabouts. So these are um, called uh, lagoons and um, the whole of it is, is known as an atoll. So each of these um, different individual uh, spots, as I may call, is an island. So this is how an island uh, here in the Maldives looks like and, and surrounded by um, the island and the vegetation and this white sand is our coral reefs. So coral reef is actually what we are made up of. So um, the Maldives is uh, very much coinciding of coral reef ecosystems. Um, coral reefs are the building blocks of our life and we are uh, very much dependent on the coral reef for our survival. The corals are these kind of little bombies that you see on the picture and massive um, uh, group of things are surrounded by our islands. And this is where we are very much dependent on. And uh, looking into the coral reef itself, Maldives is the seventh largest coral reef in the world. Even though we are very small and um, tiny, we have the seventh largest coral reef in the world. So everything that we do here in the Maldives is um, through the coral reef. Uh, Maldives is actually a country which is very much dependent on tourism and fisheries for its um, income generation. And we are kind of selling um, the beauty of it uh, through our amazing megafaunas, our coral reef ecosystems, our fish species, and everything which is included in our um, coral reef ecosystems. We are also very much dependent on it as a source of our food. So I, I can say without any doubt, 100% of Maldivians live on uh, reef fishes and other tuna and other ocean fishes, which we are uh, having uh, within our Indian Ocean. So coral reef is very much important. Uh, and not only does it act as a carbon sink, Carbon dioxide is emitted because of the um, industrial and other processes. Even though Maldives is very small, we don't have uh, large industries which emits uh, many of the greenhouse gases, which is um, affecting the climate. Uh, but however, our coral reefs are being affected. Even though they are being affected, coral reef is one of the main places which we depend on for saving us saving us indeed, because a coral reef acts as natural carbon sinks. And not only uh, are coral reefs important, but the surrounding uh, environment, such as our seagrass ecosystems, which you can see on the picture, right adjacent to the sandy beaches, 
we see the darker green. Those are our seagrass meadows, which also absorbs carbon in our atmosphere, which helps to reduce the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And in addition to that, we have mangrove or wetland ecosystems in the Maldives. And um, this is found in various atolls in the Maldives. So these are kind of the natural things that we have here in the Maldives. Even though it's small, we have literally very important ecosystems in the Maldives. And that is where I want to be highlighting today um, that something is happening. And this thing that is happening is affecting us Maldivians all of the Maldivians that we have uh, are being affected by this. So what is happening is that we are thinking. So um, on news or any other articles or things that you might have seen that um, Maldives is thinking, and this is very true. Maldives is indeed thinking, and we are seeing that every day, every year, if we are seeing a lot more different scenario than the previous months or weeks or even a few days back. So soil erosion and the sea level rising is happening and our islands are slowly going into the water. And you might be wondering like, why is it um, that we are talking about sea level rise or even soil erosion? The Maldives, the height of the land or the maximum height of the land that we have is just two meters. That is, um, if you say, uh, it's just a height of a person of a six foot. So it's just six feet um, tall, the land. And uh, with the, uh, the changing climate and with the sea level rising, we are experiencing this. And every year, even if we um, evaluate the situation, we are seeing that we are slowly sinking. We have seen islands disappear here in the Maldives. Um, and uh, we are currently very much worried about this. Not only that, but we are also um, experiencing things like coral bleaching, which is affecting the coral reefs. So, why I'm talking a lot about this coral reef ecosystem is that because coral reefs are the places which we are very much dependent on, or not only for our uh, livelihoods, but also as natural protecting, protections. So coral reefs actually help um, uh, us from things like storm surges or even um, things like tsunamis uh, when it occurs, they will kind of stop the waves coming into our islands. But however, with these kind of climate change issues, as well as natural issues like coral bleaching happening every year, every day, we are very much scared for the well-being or even living here in the Maldives is scary. And um, being a Maldivian, I want to express this uh, with all of you that this is happening. And not only is our coral reefs or our seagrass ecosystems, but also our mangroves are right now kind of dying off. So this has been experienced experiencing um, since 2019 actually. So slowly every year, the mangroves, the plants that we have, which absorbs carbon are dying off. And uh, we still haven't figured out why, but it's very much related to the changing climate. So as you can see, I'm standing right next to a beach and uh, the beach vegetations are also um, eroding and going into the sea. We are kind of donating every little um, living being as well as um, items and vegetation on our beach into the sea. This is not willingly, but this is ha happening. And naturally, we are uh, very much in danger. And um, the houses uh, that we are living here in the Maldives is just uh, one meter away from the sea la shoreline. So and um, looking into kind of the efforts that um, currently I am doing. So I have been working very much closely with the local communities and engaging with local communities, uh, making them aware of climate change. Our um, generations before me, or even my generation usually doesn't know the term climate change or what's happening because of that. Um, the, 
level of education for climate change is very low here in the Maldives. But however, um, I'm very determined and there are a uh, couple of people and um, groups of people who are trying to make the community more aware, not just our community, but the world as a whole. So in terms of my journey, like um, a lot of people in the Maldives really experience um, this kind of um, not swimming or not being able to swim so I learned how to swim when I was just 20 years old and I'm 26 now so there's a lot of um, even though we are surrounded by the ocean a lot of people doesn't know how to swim so I think and I believe that um, learning to adapt starts from swimming for Maldivians and um, with this I am very much empowered in um, teaching other people how to do this and um, I have been taking part in a lot of scientific expeditions, including I trained myself as a diver um, so that I can do these um, researches with other international organizations and um, national organization here in the Maldives in order to understand what is happening in the Maldives or the situation so that we can actually do something about it here in the Maldives. Um, and I have also been very much involved in um, adapting the local communities, teaching them how to swim, teaching them how to uh, snorkel. So even if there's, um, God forbid, uh, something happens, they are, um, uh, they are determined or they are able to uh, do something or save themselves um, if something like this happens. And um, in addition to that, I've also been very much involved in uh, the implementations or like protecting the ecosystems that we have. Um, we are experiencing uh, species loss as well. So I have been working uh, very closely with other international organizations in the past in order to um, save our marine species or even the livelihood uh, per se uh, by implementing certain measures of um, catching fishes um, so that we can preserve what we have rather than over exploiting. And um, I have been very much involved with the local communities, um, teaching kids um, that the ecosystems that we have are important. They should not be scared of going into the environment and learning for themselves, because in the past, we are very much distanced from our coral reefs or other ecosystems that we have. But now um, the younger generations are getting aware of it, and they are very much more involved um, in protecting the environment that we have. I also help in uh, cleaning the beaches around our vegetations and islands, and also uh, going into other uh, uninhabited islands in the Maldives. So even though we have 1,200 islands here in the Maldives, there's only um, less than 200 islands which people are actually living on. The rest of the islands are uninhabited islands, and um, these islands are also experiencing the sea level rise. And we can't really have access to these islands, um, but also just kind of swim onto the islands um, if you want to explore. So this is um, uh, a group of uh, people that I work with and um, who are exploring the natural ecosystems that we have in order to better understand. And I also work very much closely with women um, to empower them to raise their voice and to be confident enough to be part of the climate change adaptation. So they are very much involved in uh, with me uh, during this process. And it's uh, been a journey, but uh, people are very much aware and people are getting more interested in saving their environment. So if people are uh, knowing the impacts of climate change or how they can adapt. I believe that's the key, um, key thing that we can do here um, as a whole of nation to be more adaptive to the climate change. And um, it's very uh, interesting to see that um, there are different background of people who are currently advocating for climate change. And that is what we need here in the Maldives. Not only just Maldivians, but also people from around the globe are talking about Maldives and that we are facing these kind of issues and um, these kind of um, problems so that we can uh, have a bigger impact and save our country as a whole. Because 
if we don't do anything about this, um, I don't believe that we can be uh, very dependent on our own resources to save ourselves, but people around the globe needs to know that we are thinking we are um, having the most effects because of the changing climate. And um, even though we Moldavians are doing what we can do um, to protect ourselves and our um, ecosystems and our islands, we want your help uh, in um, establishing that uh, climate change is happening. And in order to mitigate um, the impact, we need the world to mitigate their impacts um, and their um, kind of emissions to climate change. So that's about it uh, from my side. And if you would like to contact me, this is my details. And I look forward to speaking with you in our question and answer uh, session. And thank you again, again. And I hope that um, you have been made aware of our situation here in the borders. And I hope um, to speak with you soon. Thank you. Yeah, muy buenos días. Eh, bueno, mi nombre es Efraín Nango, soy de la Nacional Chivier, eh, actualmente como soy dirigente de educación de la compañía que represento a 11 nacionalidades y 23 organizaciones de la región amazónica ecuatoriana. Eh, quiero presentar una breve introducción acerca de la Nacional Chivier. Bueno, la Confenie, más que todo en la Amazonía ecuatoriana, existen 11 nacionalidades, cada uno con su cosmovivencia diferente, con su cosmovisión, con su forma de vida y con su territorio. Específicamente las culturas, eh, la cultura Xibier es una cultura milenaria que ha eh, sobrevivido cientos de años eh, con una relación intrínseca con la naturaleza, haciéndose como la selva, como su casa. Eh, la forma de vida anteriormente ha sido nómada, pero... Actualmente ya también practicamos lo que es el sedentarismo. Eh, la lucha es, siempre es sobrevivir y defender lo suyo. En este caso específicamente eh, en la defensa es defender los territorios y las selvas ya que consideramos como la casa. Y yo, eh, igual las 11 nacionales casi tienen los mismos principios eh, porque la Amazonía es casa de las nacionalidades y también de, de los seres vivos que nos habitamos en el planeta. Bueno, la cultura Xibier ha sido una, eh, bueno, mayoría de las nacionalidades ha sido como, eh, han practicado siempre lo que es el desarrollo sostenible, una relación eh, amigable con la naturaleza sin destrucción. Es por eso que hemos vivido más de cientos de años siempre adaptados con la naturaleza. Hasta el momento tenemos también la selva en eh, algunas partes en su estado natural. Bueno, eh, en esta mañana justamente queremos compartir la incidencia del cambio climático en las comunidades amazónicas. Cuando hablamos del cambio climático es, es un tema muy complejo que, que realmente no solamente enfrentamos las nacionalidades, sino eh, todos los habitantes del planeta Tierra. La humanidad está enfrentando una serie de problemas ambientales de carácter global. Es bastante urgente. Y a la vez esto ocasiona problemas ambientales, como ustedes saben, problemas económicos, en la salud y entre otras. La crisis climática es global y muy compleja. Es decir, no solamente está afectando a una parte, sino todo el planeta Tierra está siendo golpeada. En los últimos décadas también en la Amazonía, eh, las comunidades indígenas más que todo, sufren eh, algunas actividades eh, catastróficas de la naturaleza. Y esto la naturaleza no, no hace solamente por hacer, sino es la consecuencia de las malas acciones de la humanidad. En la Amazonía, eh, como digo, en las últimas décadas ha habido cambios drásticos en, en tema de, de, de clima, que está alterando la cosmovivencia propia de las nacionalidades. Eh, cada nacionalidad tiene su calendario vivencial en las comunidades eh, en el ciclo del año. La Amazonía eh, tiene dos estaciones bien eh, determinadas, marcadas, que manejamos como las culturas eh, que vivimos ahí. Es la época lluviosa y la época eh, del sol. Y eso ha sido una estación bien marcada en el año, casi mitad, mitad. 
pero en las últimas décadas se han alterado esto y a la vez esto está alterando el ciclo ecológico, está alterando también los nichos ecológicos, los hábitats mismo y también las épocas de reproducción de las especies y también eso altera directamente, como digo, la cosmovivencia de las nacionalidades. Por ejemplo, eh, mayoría de las nacionalidades manejan, realizan su chakra, su trabajo, su producción agrícola en los meses eh, de verano para sembrar en los meses de lluvioso. Entonces ahí es cuando la época lluviosa ayuda a la fertilidad y también el crecimiento de las plantas. Pero ahora con estas alternaciones drásticas que está mezclando, eh, ha sido un factor eh, muy preocupante en las nacionalidades. Uno de los problemas más notorios que se ha afectado en la Amazonía es el exceso de la lluvia. Eh, también, las por ende, causa las inundaciones. Ya en algunas comunidades ya están sufriendo estas grandes inundaciones en, para las comunidades que habitan en las riberas de los ríos, ríos Conambo, como el río Bobonaza, Pastaza, el río Napo, y entre otros ríos importantes que se encuentran en la río, región amazónica, han habido inundaciones, lo que nunca hubo antes. Las nacionales ya saben, tienen bien limitado hasta dónde llega la inundación. Y ahí es cuando ya pasando esos eh, límites de la inundación, realizan su chacra, realizan su casa, su vivienda. Pero ahora con este exceso de lluvia, las inundaciones han llegado y muchas comunidades han sido afectadas por la inundación, perdiendo sus, eh, sus chacras, que es su producción agrícola, perdiendo también sus cositas, la casa, la casa misma. Y es muy preocupante. También el tercer punto es eh, alteración de estaciones en ciclo del año. Como decía, eh, está afectando estos eh, 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 cambios barrientes, eh, climas barrientes que se, que se está viendo en la Amazonía. Y también el aumento de la temperatura. Es notorio, he conversado con muchos eh, sabios, abuelitos, preguntando la temperatura y ellos sienten que hace años atrás eh, la temperatura era baja, pero ahora está subiendo la temperatura, entonces es notorio. Y una de las razones que, que todos sabemos es esto, en el Ecuador, aquí pueden ver la imagen, está hecho un estudio de, los, de la cubertura glaciar del Ecuador, en los volcanes específicamente, volcán Cotopaxi, volcán Chimborazo y entre otras. En el año 1990, la cubertura glaciar del hielo que correspondía a los volcanes era 97.2 kilómetros. En el año 1997, son 60.7 kilómetros, está bajando. Y en 2010 ha reducido drásticamente a 48 kilómetros metro cuadrado. Y en el 2016 está en 43.5 kilómetros cuadrado. Y bueno, no tengo un registro, de, no he buscado, del año 2020. Entonces está bajando de manera constante y eso es muy preocupante. Y es la razón por lo que aumenta el volumen de la lluvia y el volumen de los caudales del río. Todo los, el, el agua que estaba almacenado en forma de glaciar, al momento de derritir, se va directamente en los ríos y eso es lo que aumenta eh, el caudal de los ríos y también el nivel, eh, nivel del mar también sube. Y por ende, en las épocas lluviosas, las inundaciones son tan fuertes. Y todo esto es ocasionado por el, por el aumento del, de la temperatura a nivel global. Frente a esta, esta preocupación, la CONFENIAE eh, tiene acciones muy importantes. Uno de ellos es el plan estratégico de la CONFENIAE y también plan de implementación de la CONFENIAE que está hecho desde 2019 hasta 2025. Eh, y dentro de ello, cada nacionalidad tiene sus planes de vida para poder eh, actuar bajo el principio del desarrollo sostenible, bajo el principio de la conservación del medio ambiente y sin, sin dejar a un lado las necesidades básicas de las nacionalidades y de las comunidades indígenas. Dentro de ello, nuestras acciones eh, hemos empezado desde el año 2019 Acciones, eh, el plan de implementación tiene cuatro, cinco ejes, de los cuales hemos priorizado cuatro ejes importantes que tiene que ver con la legalización y saneamiento de tierras. Si queremos conservar eh, nuestro bosque, primeramente tenemos que tener nuestro territorio legalmente reconocido. Y el siguiente uso, eh, eje es uso sostenible del territorio y la biodiversidad. 
y dentro de ella una de las alternativas que queremos dar a las comunidades es eh, operación turística o sino agroturismo. También queremos fortalecer lo que es chacra ancestral integral o sino agroecología, que tiene que ver, eh, eh, tiene un objetivo de reducir la frontera agrícola en la, en la Amazonía. Tercer eje es conservación y restauración. Conservación en las áreas, en los ecosistemas de alto valor, donde todavía una parte del bosque amazónico hay áreas vírgenes, digamos, bosques primarios, eso queremos mantener en su estado natural. Y otra parte, con el tema de restauración, hay ecosistemas que ya están alterados, ya deforestados por, por ganadería y por otras actividades antropogénicas. Ahí es cuando queremos implementar con, con la reforestación. En el año 2021 se reforestó más de 200 hectáreas en el territorio quichua y también al norte en territorio cofán y siacopá. Y como el último eje que estamos priorizando es fortalecimiento de talento humano, institucionalidad de las nacionalidades indígenas de la Amazonía ecuatoriana. Dentro de ello queremos también establecer eh, lo que es la sostenibilidad financiera y es fortalecimiento institucional. Aquí quiero decir algo muy importante. El Ministerio de Medio Ambiente muchas veces prohíbe, habla de la conservación y a las comunidades simplemente quiere introducir unas leyes que son impuestas, pero no dan alternativa a las comunidades, porque las comunidades ya con su cosmovivencia son culturas milenarias que practican la cacería y la pesca sostenible. Entonces, el Ministerio del Ambiente muchas veces a los emprendedores, a las emprendedoras, especialmente a las mamás que tienen mercados en el fin de semana que sacan en la, en la ciudad, si traen o venden plato gastronómico o plato típico que es de la Amazonía, en este caso como guanta, armadillo, a veces el Ministerio del Medio Ambiente les cae, les sanciona o les multa, pero no le dan una alternativa para eh, ayudar en sus emprendimientos. Frente a todo eso, eh, la confinía está buscando primeramente crear su propia unidad técnica administrativa financiera para poder eh, concursar en los proyectos de fondos verdes a nivel mundial con el fin de implementar proyectos de desarrollo sostenible en las comunidades. También estamos implementando programas de formación integral de los directivos técnicos, juventud eh, de las nacionalidades con el fin de capacitar a a los jóvenes, para que ellos sepan administrar su territorio de manera equilibrada, de manera sostenible, y al mismo tiempo que también produzcan el, la economía, o lo que hablamos, la bioeconomía, o la economía indígena dentro de las comunidades amazónicas. Y dentro de ello, también en este, en este programa de formación, estamos hablando mucho de la educación ambiental, en las comunidades, en los niños, en las escuelas, en las unidad, eh, unidades educativas generales, en todo ello estamos implementando. Y también, bueno, como último punto es adquisición de equipos de oficina y mobiliarios por la Confinia, para que cada nacional también cuente con suficiente eh, material para poder seguir trabajando y más que todo en defensa de su territorio. Las propuestas que, que planteamos siempre como Confinia es conservar el bosque en su estado natural. Más de 60% de la región amazónica ecuatoriana pertenece al territorio de las nacionalidades y eso es lo que queremos conservar en su estado natural. Otro es reforestar los espacios alterados y también mirar al bosque selva como nuestra casa. Nuestro anhelo es que toda la ciudadanía, todo habitante del planeta Tierra mire a la selva, mire a la naturaleza como una casa, casa de todos. También dejar de ser consumistas, materialistas y amar a la naturaleza. Aplicar el principio de la pluriversidad tema pluriversidad, eh, últimamente estamos hablando mucho, donde los estudios eh, occidentales, digamos, eh, han dicho que la única forma de dar solución al problema eh, en la humanidad o el problema ambiental, cualquier problema que haya en la vida, es universidad, donde habla de un solo camino, universidad. Pero en cambio las nacionalidades, desde la Confenia y la CONAE, con nuestra estructura, hablamos de pluriversidad. Hay muchos conocimientos, cada nacional tiene su ciencia, su conocimiento, que son útiles para poder dar solución a, la, a los problemas ambientales y otros problemas que, que presenten en la sociedad. Entonces, estamos luchando mucho en ello. 
de que el conocimiento no solamente sea valorado de, los, de, de la academia, que es la universidad, sino también los conocimientos de las nacionalidades. Y también nuestro llamado es a la, a la ciudadanía, a los habitantes del mundo, sumar a la lucha de las nacionalidades en defensa de los derechos colectivos y de la naturaleza. Eh, ya que la crisis eh, climática es global y muy compleja, necesita tomar acciones eh, en el mismo nivel, es decir, de carácter global. Requiere el compromiso de todos los habitantes del planeta Tierra con la naturaleza. Y uno de ellos para hacer esto algo real es necesitamos que todos los habitantes del planeta Tierra eh, a empezar de cero, vaciar nuestra mente del pensamiento materialista y llenarnos del amor hacia la naturaleza porque somos parte de la naturaleza, solo entonces establecer, estableceremos la paz con la naturaleza, de lo contrario, eh, estamos destinados a la autodestrucción global. Somos eh, especies, digamos, eh, con razonamiento, pero sin embargo actuamos como que no tuviéramos razonamiento. Entonces, nuestro llamado desde la Confeni siempre ha sido a que cuidemos nuestra naturaleza, la selva, porque de lo contrario estamos destinados a la autodestrucción. Una de las iniciativas de la Confenie es de, como decía, más del 60% corresponde a territorio indígena y eso aporta importantísimo un dato que tenemos aquí, 80 millones de toneladas ya de carácter natural, nuestro bosque tiene, está almacenado el carbono. Si, si tumbamos todo esto, esto se emprende, desprende y se va a la atmósfera y aumentaría drásticamente el aumento de la temperatura. Entonces, eh, nuestro compromiso es, es cuidar y proteger a este bosque que es sumidero del carbono, donde contenemos tantas toneladas. Entonces, eh, mi llamado a todos eh, habitantes es que unamos a la, a la lucha de la Confenie y la iniciativa de las nacionales indígenas, que en Ecuador es Confenie, eh, a nivel internacional es COICA, que también está abarcando a nueve países. Bueno, aquí un dato importante que la misma Estrategia Nacional de Financiamiento Climático han dicho, los pueblos y nacionalidades indígenas son actores fundamentales para asegurar la gobernanza de la Amazonía y la protección de la biodiversidad, contribuyendo significativamente al combate contra el cambio climático. Eso es, es un dato importante que hay que recalcar, eh, estimados compañeros y hermanos del mundo, y una vez más agradecer y llamarle a invitarles a que cuidemos nuestra naturaleza y apoyemos las iniciativas del desarrollo sostenible, siempre con el fin de fortalecer la conservación y garantizar eh, la existencia de la naturaleza y del bosque a lo largo del tiempo. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Efraín. Elena, if you are ready, you are next. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Elena Walinga. I'm from the community of Sarayaku, also in the Ecuadorian Amazon, um, from the Quechua people. Um, and I, came, I come from the, my community also is a part of the organization that Efren is from. Um, one of uh, the things that Efren was talking about was the floods and how it has affected uh, indigenous communities and indigenous people. My community is one of those uh, communities that have been severely affected by climate change and, um, and the floods that climate change has created. So two years ago, um, my community was hit by an enormous flood uh, that caused that um, our houses disappeared, that they were swept away by the river, um, that uh, the crops that we were, that we had also were Um, destroyed by the water, which affected food security. Um, and as the presenter um, from, from Brazil was saying, um, with, with floods, uh, they, they come plagues. Uh, so for example, we had an invasion of rats, which destroyed basically everything that was left of our crops afterwards. Um, all, all, almost like uh, 50 centimeters of mud in the houses. So the people that still had their, their houses left, but they were covered in mud. Um, and this all was happening during a pandemic and there was no support from the government either. So 
um, this was a, a, a huge crisis in my community because um, as we heard in the, in the previous presentation, we have never seen effects uh, like this in our communities. And even though we have had floods before and we have been prepared for those floods, we are not, we have not been prepared for the magnitude, um, the, the magnitudes um, that we're seeing today. Um, and it still affects us until this day because it washed away our floods, our, our bridges. Um, and our bridges, we use them every day to cross the river, to the children to go to school, um, you know, to visit family, to go to the fields. But now children have to cross the river in canoe, even though um, there sometimes can be really dangerous to cross a flood in a canoe because there, uh, there are a lot of streams um, and, and, and very big waves in the river. Um, so climate change has been affecting us for a very long time now and has been affecting us in our everyday life. But um, on top of that, uh, indigenous people in the Amazon have also been facing um, the effects, the environmental effects of the fossil fuel industry, which is the main cause of uh, climate change. Um, it is estimated that in, Equ in the Ecuador and Amazon, it, there, are, there occur um, one to two oil spills per week in the Ecuador and Amazon. Um, and the most devastating ones uh, happening in the last two years um, after the Texaco oil spill. Uh, and this has left thousands of people without water, uh, but it also means that people that um, priorly have uh, relied on, for example, hunting and the drinking water has come from the rivers can no longer rely on that because the animals that they hunt could also be uh, polluted uh, with uh, crude oil that they have drunk from um, from the river. Um, and this is a struggle that is is uh, extremely hard for indigenous people in the Amazon, the, the fight against the fossil fuel industry. Um, the current government has uh, is planning and is expanding both uh, the oil exploration and mining. Um, and just today, uh, it was announced that they're now starting to drill in uh, in another part of, of Yasumi, the national park um, in the Northern Amazon. Um, and a huge uh, oil and, and mining boom is, is coming again with this government. Uh, and, and I guess and on the outside many times the current Ecuadorian government is seen as a very um, pro, you know, green or uh, ecological government, but it's, that's not the reality. Um, there have been uh, some, um, he, for example, the president, for example, expanded the marine uh, reservation, the Galapagos Islands, but that doesn't mean really that uh, he's, or they are protecting the Amazon because it's uh, on the contrary, they're now coming with all force into the Amazon. Um, and this is why free prior and informed consent is so important in Ecuador and in all other countries that are facing extractivism because that tool gives us the right to decide over our own territories and what happens to it. Um, and that's why it's so important that it's in our constitution uh, but it's also important that it's fulfilled and um, and that it actually happens because now a lot of the processes that happen are manipulated um, uh, and are not uh, not really respecting the sovereignty of, of indigenous people. Um, and this is something that happens throughout the Amazon that oil companies and mining companies come in and do not really have the consent of uh, the local people and of the indigenous people, but they have the concessions that the government has given them. And then they do not respect the decision that indigenous people have made, which is that they do not want extractivism on, um, on their lands. So this is one of uh, the big struggles that uh, the Amazon faces, but also because indigenous people and rural and uh, communities are the most underfunded ones when it comes to education, when it comes to um, when it comes to healthcare, there is a lot of internal struggles that we have to um, that we have to tackle, uh, and one of them, as I said, is education. And my community, Sarayaku, is 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 working on that right now um, to improve education. Um, I believe there are studies made that uh, show that um, indigenous communities here are the ones that have the least access to 
um, to education at all or ed education of, of quality. Uh, but that, that also means that when we um, kind of integrate ourselves to the Western idea of, of education, we leave aside um, our own education, which is our ancestral knowledge and what our elders and uh, what our uh, ancestors um, have left us. So in order to combat those two issues, my community has um, is right now working on a new curriculum uh, to improve education in our communities and to make sure that our own knowledge and our own uh, cosmovision and our own way of seeing seeing the, the, the world and, and viewing life is integrated and is a base to our new education. Um, and that we also can combat, for example, migration to the cities um, in, 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 in the search of education, um, that we can combat that with actually providing good education and education of quality in our own communities. Um, so there are a lot of different struggles, a lot of different fronts in, in, um, in, in indigenous communities. One is the one, you know, fighting against extractivism, but one, another one is also improving our own um, lives here in, in the community. Um, I think what is just very, very important to, um, to mention is that just um, in, in general, um, most, um, the most biodiverse areas, areas and the most protected areas are under the custodianship of indigenous people, which is why it is so important to make sure that indigenous people's rights are respected and that indigenous people's decisions are respected. Um, and so in order to, for example, protect the Amazon, it's firstly important to protect the people that are protecting the Amazon, which are indigenous people. Um, and for that, I mean, right now, um, the Escazú, the first COP Escazú is happening in Chile. Um, and, and it's so important that countries actually ratify the agreement because it's a binding agreement. Um, and it is a tool that indigenous people could use to defend ourselves uh, in these struggles, for example, against extractivism. And in that way, we could protect the Amazon and we can continue protecting the Amazon as we have done for thousands of th and thousands of years. Um, and I think that's the most important lesson to, to that I can give you, I guess, um, and it's not just in the Amazon, it's everywhere. It's in the North and the South, everywhere where indigenous people's rights are respected, the biodiversity and the natural areas will be protected as well. So um, thank you for giving me the space and for taking the time to listen to me. Thank you so much, Gabriel, Ace, Naf, Efren and Elena for sharing your insights. Uh, please switch on your cameras uh, because we will now start our closing discussions with questions from the audience. Um, so audience, now is the time to pose your questions for our wonderful panelists in the Q&A tab. Uh, while you send in yours, I will go ahead and ask the first question. So there's a question for all and any one of you can answer. And my question is, what is your final message um, or call to action for the attendees who are here today, those who will watch the streaming later, and those who are interested in acting on the current climate crisis. Well, I guess I can start. Um, I think one of the main goals that we all need to do is work together. Um, you know, my main goal is, as uh, Indigenous royalty here at OU is to push all of our Native students into uh, every single piece of academia that we have. Um, and that is because of our own perspective and our cultural advancement. Um, you know, no matter what, um, no matter what career you're going into, you can always be an advocate for uh, environmental sustainability, uh, climate change impacts. Um, th there's many ways that you can uh, advocate for, for this uh, for this movement. I guess you could say. Um, so I would highly advise, you know to look into this, you know, uh, the best way that I see fit is to see climate change and the way that we see the world uh, with a first-hand perspective. I believe that with this first first-hand perspective, 
that you get to see with your own eyes, hear with your own ears, feel with your own hands, uh, taste with your own mouth, smell with your own with your own um, uh, senses here, you know, I believe that it makes more of an impact on your perspective. Um, so no matter what you do, if you uh, if you work in an office, you know, look up, listen, listen to a, a podcast, listen to a TED talk, listen to something on environmental, something on climate change, something on culture. You know, uh, we are indigenous people are very, very underrepresented uh, people here on here on the planet. We have five percent of the global population is indigenous people, but 70 to 80% of conservation lands are in indigenous communities. And that really says a lot about how indigenous people lead, um, uh, lead uh, uh, conservation uh, efforts into our societies. And that's why we are always on the fight to uh, engage ourselves, to be more represented in society, um, even to non, indigenous or non-cultural uh, perspectives, you know, people need to see us in that light. Um, you know, when people don't see us in that light, that means that we aren't, uh, we aren't important to them. You know, we don't mean anything, anything that we do that is not making money or going into the technologically advanced field or whatever it may be, you know, the, the main mainstream media, I don't know, whatever, whatever it may be, if we do not uh, connect to that we do not connect to them so this is one thing that i think we need to do is really make ourselves be known really make ourselves be heard and like i said no matter what field you are going into you can, you can do your part and i highly highly uh you know stress that and uh, i think it would uh, really benefit all of us here uh, as as one people uh to save our planet you know like i said before we're almost at the point of no return to where we can't reverse the this this role of, of climate change that we are going to be in and it's really going to affect our kids and our grandkids and the next generations to come they're going to have to deal with what we have done our parents have done our grandparents have done everything that that our um, past generations whenever uh you know um we started releasing co2 emissions into this into this planet or when we started polluting the planet you know we didn't make much of an effort and now we're paying for it. Now we're going to have to be watching our kids and worry about them. And that's what scares me. I have kids myself, and that's what scares me. So do your part. We can always do a part. I hope. Now, if you had a hand up too, would you like to add on to something? Yeah. Um, once again, thank you. Uh, and uh, I think my final message would be, um, do something on your individual levels as well. So um, we can't really um, rely on um, everybody or depend on somebody to take actions, but um, even individual efforts um, can uh, have a massive difference in your communities, especially uh, when it comes to things like climate change and adaptation and or even making people aware. It's important that um, we, uh, take that step, um, even if it is through social media marketing or uh, giving individual awareness in their communities, we need to be um, kind of conjoining and joint forcing uh, forces with other people so that um, we uh, as an individual or eager uh, group of people can uh, help uh, the issue of climate change. Thank you. We have a question for Elena. Um, what is needed to make your education project possible? Um, what is needed? Uh, that's a good one. Um, well, right now we're kind of just on our own um, de developing the curriculum and making sure that we can um, put together our own cosmovision, our own way of, of seeing life, our way of living into kind of integrated with um, Western science. Um, and yes, unfortunately, uh, what is always needed is funding um, to go through with projects, um, and especially big ones like this, because this is something that we're hoping that we can not only implement for small ch children, but also for, um, for, for example, high school students. And then later when we actually have created this, that so we can um, try uh, this in other communities as well, because this is something that is only in my community right now and only 
uh, my territory. Um, but in order to spread it, um, of course, um, that's just another step. So, um, you know, if, if there are people that, you know, can support in, in guiding what it, when it comes to education, um, just, or just, you know, giving tips on how to work with children, like that, of course, would be very, very welcomed. Um, uh, and I think the, the, the part where it's, you know, about teaching uh, our own ancestral knowledge that we already have here. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's, if that answers your question. Thank you. I think that is uh, one of the most common challenges that a lot of communities from the global south always mention, you know, like the lack of funding and the lack of access, uh, which also goes to some of the points that uh, Gabriel mentioned. Uh, for you, Gabriel, is my next question. And this goes hand in hand with that um, lack of access, either in spaces or information. You also mentioned the language barrier and we are trying to be um, accessible and trying to cross that barrier as much as we can. You know, for our panel too, we have a Spanish speaker with um, the help of a translator. Um, but my question and our question for you is um, what are what has been some useful ways to bridge these gaps, uh, bridge these like challenges um, and in order to promote the valuable information that all of you are sharing today? Yeah, thank you for the question. I, I would like, first of all, to echo what the previous speakers have said about cooperation and about the use of the cos indigenous cosmovision in other spaces as well. I think um, in the academia, we have this lack of access to different knowledges and it's of course purposeful. It's, it's derivated from the structural racism that structured our academia. And I think a way to open this access is through events like this, of course, and promoting like live translations and opening other spaces. I think Elena mentioned the Escazú Agreement. It's really important as well that here in Brazil, we make pressure to ratify it because it's not ratified yet. And it would open um, an incredible space for participation of civil society, not only with indigenous people, but other environmental defenders such as the black communities and poor people in the favelas. So I think a way to, you know, promote this access is, of course, through accessible research to make all of the things that we are saying here more accessible to different spaces and engaging with people who are outside of our academic world or are, are outside of our communities. I think the local level is really important as a way to achieve that. If you leave your university, if you leave your neighborhood, you're going to find someone who doesn't know about climate change or racism and you can teach them about that. And I think we have this important role to spread the message and to build a, to build a, a purposeful change for the world. Um, Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, um, una de las preguntas es la importancia de la sabiduría de los, de los sabios, de las nacionalidades en tema de conservación. Uno es porque las nacionalidades son culturas milenarias que han sobrevivido, eh, teniendo una relación muy intrínseca con la naturaleza sin, la, sin destruirla. Entonces, uno de ellos es el sistema agroecológico o la chacra ancestral, que practicamos todas las nacionalidades, las 11 nacionalidades. Eh, donde la chacra ecológica consiste en que abrimos un pequeño espacio, territorio de, de tumbar árboles, un pequeño espacio, y dentro de esa área tan pequeña se, se produce eh, variedad de, de productos. Y eso es lo contrario a la, al monocultivo, en cambio monocultivo eh, tumban espacios, hectáreas de, eh, de terreno, toman árboles y luego eh, siembran un solo especie. En cambio, en la chacra es una variedad de productos con un espacio muy pequeño y eso garantiza también la soberanía alimentaria de las comunidades y a la vez limitamos el avance de la frontera agrícola de, en la Amazonía. Y otro es eh, que la sabiduría de las nacionalidades es importante porque existen seres espirituales eh, invisibles que tienen que ver con, la, con el mundo, con la vida de las nacionalidades. Y de, de, desde ahí se parte con los niños 
se enseña a respetar a la naturaleza, se enseña a los niños desde temprana edad que hay que conservar, porque ahí viven seres espirituales que son dioses, que, que nos protegen, que, tiene, que son dios de la cacería, de la chacra, de la producción, de todo. Entonces, desde ahí empieza la conservación de los niños. O sea, los niños aprenden a conservar y amar a la naturaleza. De lo contrario, simplemente van a, a convertirse en unas personas que, extra, extractivistas. Entonces, es por eso importante el conocimiento de las, de las nacionalidades, de los abuelos y de las abuelas. Y el mensaje es que, que el problema no está afuera. Para hablar del cambio climático y de la conservación ambiental, no está afuera, sino está en el interior de cada persona, en la mente y en el corazón de, de cada persona. Entonces, es necesario que tenemos que empezar con la concientización de las personas y más que todo empezando desde los niños para que estos aprendan a, a valorar y amar a la naturaleza, a naturaleza. Entonces, solamente entonces, una vez que la sociedad cambie su mente, entonces garantizaremos la conservación y el, y el protección del medio ambiente. Muchas gracias. Gracias, Efren. Thank you, Efren. Uh, Efren gave a very important uh, message about uh, the importance of um, preserving elders' wisdom in our communities especially because they know ways in which uh, we kind of not understand uh, the importance of nature and nature for many indigenous communities is very related with um, non-human kind of spirits or uh, entities that uh, are important for the community. And they teach children since very young ages to love nature, to love uh, these entities that are um, non-human type of entities and especially to understand that they need to come combine or to live with nature as part of one more entity in our planet. So thank you so much, a friend. Uh, we appreciate your, your participation. And before I pass it on to Felipe for closing remarks, I also would like to echo um, some of the key things that all of you mentioned, which is um, the fact that many of us who are coming from representing these communities have been talking about or um, experiencing these issues for a very, very, very long time. And um, it has been very unfortunate to either find these spaces or create these spaces. Um, and the, some of the challenges that um, many of you mentioned in uh, in even having the space to talk about the issues uh, from the communities that we come from. Um, and a lot of the time it is the passion that we have that really fires up um, even the hope to continue talking about the same crisis for centuries, for decades, and for days. Um, so this issue is so present in um, so many of our lives. And um, I'm sure it must have not been very easy to continue talking about it. But I'm so thankful for the attendees who came, who came here to listen and to learn. And so that from as we move on from this symposium, then we are filled with the hope um, and the desire to act on the climate crisis. Now I would like to pause us um, to Felipe to, for our closing remarks. Thank you so much, Naifa. What you said resonates with all these young speakers that are like working uh, from their own um, places to, to make a change with their uh, capabilities and resources. And this is an amazing work that you have been doing. And we are honored for have you here. And I is my hope that all people who are listening to us will resonate with your message and will actually work and participate in their own communities, in their own universities, institutions to create a small changes because a small change, if we do it all together, can be a big, big change in the world. We have now come to an end of this Youth Perspectives on Climate Change Symposium. Once again, we would like to thank our five speakers, Gabriel, Ace, Efren, Elena, and Naf, joining us from Brazil, Oklahoma, Ecuador, and the Maldives and sharing your valuable knowledge and insight on how your communities are affected so deeply by various climate injustices. We would also like to highlight our sponsors and show gratitude for assisting us at various capacities through the organizational and executional processes. Our heartfelt thanks goes to the Center for Peace and Development and the Security in Context Think Tank, and our mentor for the event, Dr. Angela Pearson, and the grant from the Carnegie Foundation. Naifa and I hope that you are leaving our symposium having learned about how the climate crisis affects different communities around the globe and the deeper and complex issues that accentuates the vulnerability of these communities. We also hope that these remarks 
by our panelists have inspired you to take actions and will start or continue to do your individual part in this global issue. Therefore, we would like to invite you to follow our webpage uh, where we will post the recordings of the symposium as well as the presentations, uh, PowerPoints and additional resources to guide you as you continue educating yourselves. We appreciate your time and you spent with us. Thank you so much. Thank you guys.